Today we're with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. And by the way, if you haven't seen his uh, newsletter, go to johnmariani.com. And every month you're going to have a treat of uh, interesting stories, uh, food stories, mystery stories, and just stories about food in general. John, uh, we had some uh, relatives over and uh, for a little party a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we were going to go out to dinner, And but we started with a cocktail. And as I was serving various people a glass of wine or a, a, a mixed drink or whatever, I thought to myself, the, the, the word aperitif is never used anymore. And before dinner, it was traditional to have an aperitif, a a libation that would get your mouth going, would excite the juices. I, I mean, and, and I don't know that they, did, does anybody even use the word anymore? And and what would be a, an appropriate aperitif before dinner, as opposed to, you know, your favorite cocktail or glass of wine? Yeah, the um, <clears throat> aperitif and cocktail become a little blended together. Uh, I don't think anybody says potables anymore, uh, <laughs> John. But an aperitif was, as you say, designed to stir the appetite um, because the ingredients generally had some kind of uh, spices in them that would, in fact, be based on old monks or monks <laughs> of olden times who were the pharmacists of the medieval period of the Middle Ages. And they were the ones who had these cupboards full of uh, sometimes very rare spices like ginger and cloves and, <clears throat> and cinnamon. And they would mix them, mix them up into these elixirs um, and add alcohol and uh, give them to their patients. And the patients generally felt better because it had alcohol in it. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a joke about a dying nun who refused to, to take water <clears throat> or take a glass of cow's milk. And then uh, one nun suggested they put a shot of uh, brandy in there and she, the nun drank it and she <clears throat> was restored for another 24 hours. And her dying words were, don't sell that cow. Well, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's Queen Elizabeth's favorite joke, by the way. Uh, so that's what the monks were all about, and they truly believed it. So that through the ages, if you have things like Campari, if you have things like Fernet Branco, Punta Mess, um, which are generally have a sweet, a bittersweet component, the bitterness will in fact spur your appetite, and the sweetness will kind of make you feel delighted, and the alcohol will perk you up. So that's what an aperitif really is. And uh, as I said, uh, um, uh, noy pract, sweet vermouth, red vermouth, these are things that are designed to be an aperitif, usually served in a small glass. You know, if you, if you took a, <clears throat> a wine glass and cut it in half, that's about an aperitif style. And it should be just one or two sips and la la, okay, bring on the food. Um, cocktails which come out of the United States, the term at least. Nobody has, for sure has pinned down where the term cocktail comes from. There's many, many, uh, uh, many versions of the story, uh, but it does go back to the 19th century. These were stiffer drinks, okay? Um, now remember back in the 19th century, everybody in the Anglo world, England and the colonies, <clears throat> were drinking mainly very cheap gin and rum, which came from the colonies which came from the Caribbean because they used sugar to make rum. So these were drinks which were pretty stiff. Rum would always be mixed with water, but nobody thought of them as a, they thought of them as a pick-me-up, but not as a uh, appetite uh, 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 stimulator. Um, they were really hard drinks, hard cider even. <clears throat> you know, uh, Cocktails came along when people said, hmm, what if, what if we add this to them, a little lemon and some uh, and some uh, water would be a little and then let's say a little out of it so depending upon the availability of let's say citrus oranges limes and lemons an inordinate number of cocktails are based on the juices using those pineapple um uh coconut 
uh, later on from the from the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, nor, enormous number of cocktails use them uh, from the specific at the specific time those fruits started to come into um, into the United States. Uh, the Bloody Mary was invented only because vodka was coming into Japan. Uh, I'm sorry, Paris at the time at a bar called Harry's New York Bar. And there, a uh, gentleman from America had also brought some tomato juice, which the French had never heard of before. <clears throat> they put the vodka and tomato juice together with a little shot of Tabasco sauce, and voila, it was originally called the Bucket of Blood, um, and uh, Henri Petiot was the inventor of it. And then it came to the United States to the Regency Bar in New York, where they Bucket of Blood was a little too much, so they called it the Bloody Mary instead. And... Uh, so that was what, how, how cocktails were born. And it was only in these American bars that started to show up in Europe <clears throat> during Prohibition, because Americans would go to Europe and want to drink, and they couldn't get back in the United States. They wanted a cocktail. You have to go to a speakeasy. Okay? Um, so these American bars started to pop up in, in European hotels, mainly, because they didn't have bars. You went to a bar in Italy, it was a cafe that served you know, Campari or uh, Madeira or something like that. Um, and they started to make these, make these cocktails over there. Um, and that's how the world over there was introduced to cocktails. And if I, frankly, I find that with classic cocktails, martinis, daiquiris, Manhattans, I have found that uh, European bartenders, real serious ones, they're called barmen in England, barmen over there really make exquisite classic cocktails, even the one I have in the back of my car in my daiquiri recipe. Uh, whereas in the United States, they futz around with fake lime juice or, or, or uh, uh, bad bad liquors, uh, bar liquors, uh, Back of the house liquors, uh, whatever they call them, and uh, <clears throat> they don't know how to make them. They want to make them frozen. They don't have. They just don't have the right ingredients, and they don't know how to make them. Um, so that's the uh, deal. But you can, of course, still go and buy aperitifs. Uh, sherry was a very, very big aperitif um, at one time, especially among the the Anglo's. Now, uh, sherry is not drunk much in in Spain at all, and white port not the red kind, uh, white port, uh, chilled, uh, was also an aperitif. But you were right, they are there to spur the appetite. <clears throat> Just a shot or two like that. I mean, I can't, I don't know anybody who drinks two or three or four glasses of, uh, of a Punta Mes or <laughs> something like that, <laughs> Mazzotti. Uh, you drink it, now you might drink it as a cocktail by adding soda water and so forth. Uh, I mean, the um, Negroni, of course, is Campari and sweet vermouth and soda water, and the Americano has a, a orange juice in it. So that can certainly be used in cocktails, but uh, that's the difference. And um, to this day, somebody, some people, some old timers will uh, go and uh, have one of these aperitifs and then finish off with Fernet Branca, which is the most disgusting, bitter flavor uh of all I, I used to drink it if i had a huge italian meal i would have fennel bronco settle your stomach and guess who invented that stuff the old <laughs> time physicians and pharmacists back in italy in the 17th 18th century that's where fennel bronco comes from but it kind of works hmm. well so I, I seem to remember from uh, uh when i used to do a lot of business lunches uh particularly in new york city uh that any drink that you had before a meal was generally, generally uh, not sweet. It was dry, uh, and it it makes sense that that would sort of set your palate apart and say, okay, let's now prepare to enjoy the meal, which is going to be tasty. And then afterwards, somebody would have something that would be very sweet. Uh, so that all seems to make some kind of sense. Well, there were cordials. Cordials were yeah. generally kind of ladies' drinks, or the first things that you would have uh, after uh, you turn 16 or something. And they, they, they range from creme de menthe and creme de cacao, mm. uh, things like that, Cointreau, triple sec. Um, and those are kind of desserts. And then you have, of course, the cognacs and the, the, the whiskeys uh, as a sitting by the fire after dinner, post post yeah. uh, post dinner um 
And then you have the nightcap, which is almost invariably a shot of something, uh, but not a cordial. I don't think anybody has a creme de menthe with, uh, with, uh, next to a bottle of scotch if it happens to be there. But yeah, there's all sorts of reasons during the time of day. But of course, Art, if you were having those boozy uh, business luncheons, the three martini lunch was a real right. thing at mm. one time. It was. Well, I, I just want to take us full circle. And we've talked about before dinner and during dinner, after dinner. I want to take us to the morning when you wake up and have a shot of Boone's Farm uh, raspberry wine. That's There you go. That's yeah, what yeah. we got to remember. Well, you know, Dean Martin said, he says, oh, you know, I pity people who don't drink because when they get up in the morning, that's the best they're going to feel all day. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.